Is all this focus on narcissistic abuse and narcissist unfair? Are we actually demonizing a personality disorder? Well, in this episode, Tara and I delve into the pushback that we've gotten about talking about abuse and abuse related topics. And the self-help tip is how to use a detailed personal history of work and relationships as a way to examine whether or not you might be the narcissist in the relationship. Thank you for joining us on Breaking Free from Narcissistic Abuse. I'm Dr. Carrie Kerr McAvoy, a mental health specialist with over 20 years of counseling experience. And I'm Tara Blair Ball, a certified relationship coach. This is a listener supported podcast. Please consider becoming a supporter of the show for less than a cup of coffee. You can see a link in the show notes below. So, Carrie, as I've been creating content for our new Breaking Free from Narcissistic Abuse social media, platforms, which just a plug, you can find us on Facebook, YouTube, TikTok, and Instagram under breaking at breaking free from narc abuse. As I've been creating content for these social media platforms, I've been seeing lots of our comments about narcissists in general. And one of the most common troll comment or, or really just criticism is are all narcissists abusive? Are we being mean, demonizing them? Don't they deserve healthy relationships? Don't they deserve content that helps educate them on improving their behavior? And I know I've shared some of these with you and we've both kind of laughed at this, but I think it's important to have a conversation about why we need to point out and address the issues with narcissists as well as assess, you know, are our all narcissist abusive? What do you think when I ask those questions? I, I think narcissists who are in recovery, who are doing a lot of hard work and self-reflection, uh, which is not natural. That, that's a skill set. Well, that's mm-hmm. a skill set many of them don't have. I think that group probably is not terribly abusive. I think the potential is always there. I heard a really great analogy uh, from Dr. Romani, and I love this, is that she talks about the rubber band theory that you can have somebody who's narcissistic and their tendency is to be abusive. Because if you stand back and look at the DSM-5-9 criteria, they're having problems being intimate, really showing themselves. They're struggling with self-initiative, having goals and pursuing those goal defe- goals effectively. They're not empathic naturally. And if they are, they tend to weaponize it. They tend to use mm-hmm. their sympathy as a way to um, garner attention or to be the victim and to really kind of capitalize on those around them's feelings. And, uh, and, and then they're just entitled and arrogant and think that somehow the rules don't apply to them. When you take that whole package, I don't know how you cannot be abusive. Exactly. I mean, that does not sound like I don't want to live with like I want to live with somebody like that. It, but so she says, when when you're like that, that you're like a rubber band, you can stretch it and stretch it and make it change and show some differences. But the minute there's stress, it pops back into its original shape. And I think that's a really great way to reflect this. So you can be in a relationship with somebody who's doing a lot of hard work, really to be consciously different. But that doesn't mean it isn't a stressful moment. They're not going to pop off and be difficult. But but to take but to take those criteria, those those the DSM five criterion and look at them and say, wow, that would be really hard to live with somebody like that, even to work for somebody like that or have a neighbor like that means every time that you bring the garbage bin out to the driveway in your neighborhood and your neighbor who's like that sees you slightly maybe to skew or at the wrong time, they're going to be next thing you know, they're going to be calling the company reporting you. They're just, they're (laughs) difficult people. Mm -hmm. They're very, they're very um, just difficult people. But it's interesting how we get this pushback. And I'd love to know why you think we get it. Do you have some theories on that? Whenever I'm defensive, it's often a situation of there's some kernel of truth that maybe there's something I'm not quite ready or wanting to look at. So when someone asks this question, like, you know, are we being mean or are we overusing this term or blah, blah, blah? Maybe it is a way of sort of not looking at our own actions. Or I wonder, too, if it's predatory people who don't want content out there educating about what is narcissistic abuse and what are the things that narcissists do to victims. And so they want to keep having the supply and their next victim. So maybe maybe something like that. Um, Yeah, I I see it the same. I see it as as an attack. It's a it's an antagonistic attack against content that makes them feel uncomfortable. I think mm -hmm. they're feeling called out and they don't like being called out. 
And one of the things they're really good at doing is whenever they're feeling attacked, they feel like all's fair. So they have no no qualms of getting really, really nasty back. And I, I have read some comments that are just like scathing, you know, mm-hmm. horrifically scathing, attacking um, my worthiness as a person, my likability, even my professionalism. I mean, they, they make it personal. They'll take something that we're talking about that's a dynamic and they'll make it personal, which actually is a form of gaslighting called DARVO. So, you know, it's interesting because they tend to out themselves. And that's usually how I respond. It's like, hmm, that's very interesting. You're responding this way because ten- this tends to be a good litmus test. And then they usually don't say anything because, you know, I've kind of called them out. But but I do think, you know, here's the bigger picture to me. Is all all abusive behavior narcissistic? No. Are all narcissistic abusive people narcissist? No. But I do think that there is a greater awareness than there has ever been about abusive behavior and what really healthy behavior should look like. And the, and the, and I think as a society, we're recognizing there's a massive gap between truly civil, hospitable behavior and just offensive behavior. That there's a lot of we do a lot of things that are unreasonable to each other a lot of the time. Mm-hmm. And I think that's make that dialogue is makes people uncomfortable. Absolutely. And... I had a big discussion around the simple phrase. It was actually not even, it's not even my sound. I made a video using somebody else's sound called, um, when somebody says, after all I've done for you, mm. and then it was an analysis of how it was a breach of contract that was really transactional, you would not believe the pushback I got to that video, to enough so that I actually created a subsequent video to talk about that should not be a stipulation to relationships. We should not go into relationships thinking, Tara, because I'm here today, you owe me something. And if you don't show mm-hmm. me the right kind of appreciation, then I'm angry with you. That we need right. to see ourselves going into whatever we do because it's what we want to do, because mm-hmm. it reflects who we are, or we shouldn't be doing it. But I think I have a feeling most of us don't understand the degree that we are doing what we do based upon what we hope to get from another person. You even talked about that. And I'd love you to revisit this about, because I see that that video really triggered men. Yeah. And you'd mentioned this before when you were working with men, how many of them saw all the things that they're doing as something that should be recognized and how hurt they were that there was nothing coming from their, you know, showing up and their working and all the stuff that they do that's very sacrificial. So I, I've worked with a lot of men over the course of my career. And what I have seen actually is that my male clients tend to more often be people pleasers than my female clients. I And I don't know if that's just the people I've met with or or what, but a lot of the men that I have worked with are people pleasers where this they expect something in return for the things that they do and they get very angry and resentful and hold grudges over these perceived slights. And they may be things they've never even communicated. They've never said to their partner, hey, I'm doing this for you. And because I'm doing this, I would really like X in exchange. It's very transactional, as you said. I bet you, I bet they even said, never said to the partner, do you want me to do this for you? Exactly. And too often when I've worked with couples, there's been an utter disconnect in them doing this thing that they say is for the other person, but is not it's selfishly motivated. It is not, in fact, what that other person wants or has asked for or in any way communicated. But there, the intent is I'm doing this for you and I expect something in return. And if I'm not getting that in return, even though I've never communicated it to you, I am very upset. <laughs> so it's a dynamic that is very problematic. One of the things I see is narcissistic abuse to me. I'm not saying this is, I'm, I'm just throwing this out there. It almost feels like it's on a continuum. Mm-hmm. And, and the continuum is at the low end, we're a little abusive when we don't have good boundaries and we don't, we're not really clear why we do what we do and we're not really clear in what we expect for what we do. And we get sloppy about that. And then we get angry when our partner doesn't show up or appreciate mm-hmm. it or see it. And then you get all the way to the extreme end, the pathological end, where you have somebody who's in the relationship solely to use the other person. Mm-hmm. The person so now so much doesn't exist that they're actually like a property, this person's asset or property. So to me, it's it's layers of gradation between how much can I respect you and see you for who you are and then clear, clarify my intentions with you to all the way to that I don't see you at all and you don't matter to me anymore. 
and that's very, very sick. And so it, to me, are we demonizing narcissists? Maybe, maybe calling this narcissistic abuse was the wrong name. I don't know what other names to call it because I've even thought about, well, what could we call it? Because you and I have talked about what's the difference between emotional abuse and narcissistic abuse. But it has to do with this, this failure of a relationship to be reciprocal and be respectful to really a failure to see the other person as, as having integrity in themselves for who they are. Mm-hmm. And, and that to me, I don't think we can demonize that enough. I think that's, we're cannibalizing people. When we fail to respect them and see them, then they're no more meaningful to me than the tuna fish that I ate for lunch today. Mm-hmm. And I think that's terrible. I think that's the hardest thing when I think of the criteria of the narcissist is the lack of empathy. You and I are a very empathic person, empathic people. And that means that we can both be very careful about how we approach or speak to or handle situations with other people because of that level of empathy we have. I I would consider myself as very in tune with the feelings of others. And that's very clearly a trauma response for me that I can be very hypervigilant. I'm like, how are you feeling? How are you doing? You know, but on the other side of it, it does mean that I am, I am careful at evaluating and looking at the impact of my actions as well as my intention. And if someone lacks the empathy, they may not have that same understanding of that impact. And that impact is so important in assessing how do I own my own part? How do I make amends? How do I make it right? And if you are missing that impact, missing even understanding what it was like for you to have hurt someone or negatively impacted them, how are you going to not be abusive in some way? If I can call you a name and not be, you know, not really consider that impact, why would I, why would I need to apologize or change or see it any differently? Here, here's the other thought I had as you were saying that for, for years, for decades, we have been demonizing victims. Mm-hmm. If you really stand back and consider it for a moment, even think about the typical victim profile. How insulting is that? It was seen as, I, I can tell you who it was. It was a she. She came from a poor background, troubled home, um, um, was probably severely neglected and abused, made poor choices in men maybe even had multiple relationships with multiple different dads with her kids. And now she's struggling as she bounces from home to home and she's getting battered in the process. And we all kind of feel it. And she can't, and she does not holding a job down very well. And we all look at her and we basically, we judge her for that. Mm-hmm. And we, we've seen her as weak. We see her as a person who can't set good boundaries. She's needy. She can't recognize danger when she sees it. And we kind of, as a culture has said, she deserves what she's got. Mm-hmm. And for years, we have dumped on that woman. And, and yeah, we provide, resentfully provide resources to her, but we don't see that she's actually a culprit to abusers, that this has been a, sus- a system, a setup that has systematically destroyed her to where now she is a, a, a ghost, a figure of what she could have been if, had she been in the right situation. To me, this is what we've done is we've turned the table and we're turning the spotlight where it deserves. It Mm -hmm. always deserved to be on the one who's been doing the abusing, not on the one who's been abused. And the other really bizarre thing that they have found is when they started looking at, is that actually that trope, that, that, that profile accurate? They found, no, it's not accurate. It only applies to one third of all the victims on narcissistic Mm -hmm. abuse. Two thirds were high functioning without troubled homes and without trauma of their own. And here's the fascinating part. But if you catch them at the end of that narcissistically abusive relationship, they look like her mm. because that's what's happened to them in the, in the course of that relationship. The relationship has destroyed them, their sense of self has even, like you shared, you shared, a it was in the last example on the last podcast, you shared about how you stopped driving because you got to be a worse mm-hmm. driver when you're in the seat with that person. Can you? That's what they do. They systematically strip everything out that you felt secure around and make you insecure. I stopped driving too. I stopped doing a lot of things. I stopped writing. I stopped trying to, I would stumble over my words talking to people. Mm -hmm. I just got shaky everywhere. I started to no longer believe in myself. I started to step back and getting super insecure, all from the way that this person would make little digs here and a little comment there and how I could do it better over there. Next thing I know, I'm doing less and less and less and less. I was systematically becoming her. 
And I feel like, are we demonizing narcissists? No, we're putting the spotlight where it's always should have been in the first place. That example shows exactly the fact that two thirds of narcissistic abuse victims were high functioning, probably successful, super agreeable, kind, personable people were targeted by narcissists shows that they sought out prey people who were strong and charismatic and wonderful and then sucked them dry. Yeah. Mate turned them into weak and helpless people. That's what the narcissist did. Yeah. And I saw Someone, that for myself. And yeah, I know you saw I, that too. It, was it you that said this? Somebody said this is that they see the strength that's outside of themselves. And they then, oh, I think it was Dr. Carter who said this. They see the strength that's outside of themselves. And then they basically systematically suck that out until the mm. person's a reflection of who they actually feel themselves to be. On the inside. Yeah, exactly. They turn you into who they see, they feel that they are while they basically cannibalize your strengths. Yeah, it makes me more and more angry just talking about it. it, it I feel, I don't wish anybody to be born with this disorder. And I do think it's a disorder that's both made and born. I think it's a combination of things. It's nurture and nature together that has to come together to have this happen. But on the other hand, once you start to realize that they're, you're having a systematic track record of, of destruction and you're starting to realize, wow, I mean, I leave a wake of failed relationships and I'm not succeeding at work. I think then that's like, oh, maybe you should be stopping and taking a look at this. Maybe it's time for you to quit blaming everybody around you and, and take responsibility for yourself. But see, I know that's part of the innate problem is they don't want that scary. It's so shame based. They feel like they'll crumble. But here's the thing. We never grow if we don't face our pain. So even mm -hmm. the fact that calling us out for demonizing them is just another form of, I don't want to face my pain. You triggered me. Your video on this topic is too close to home. I don't like it. So yeah. instead of me pausing and doing something about it and figure out why I don't like it, I'm going to say you shouldn't have made that comment. And I've also, we have also received a lot of comments about how all women are narcissists. Oh yeah. All women are I've narcissists. Seen this. And it's very like, not specific, all. All women are narcissists. And notice that you and I are both women, you know, so I guess we would be included in this as narcissists. <laughs> and clearly those people are very hurt to put that. Clearly they've had a history of very painful relationships. I know many of my male clients have had that in their past. They had a painful relationship with their mother, who may have been a narcissist, uh, with, with romantic partners. And I absolutely get that. But the fact that it's all demonizing a whole group, you know, a whole gender doesn't show that accountability piece, that ownership piece of how, how was, what did I do to get in these situations? How did, how did my lack of boundaries, et cetera, impact how those relationships went? You know, it's not just all women are bad because that's not true. That can't yeah. be true. You know? Yeah. I, I think they're piggybacking on the not all men thing because mm. women are saying we can't tell who's safe and who's not safe. We, so we just say that all men are. And now mm. you and I know that that's not absolutely not true. There's a lot of, I mean, my three sons are safe. I don't know, mm. definitely not all men. Your husband's safe. So, but I, I do think, I have noticed that too. They want to, they want to say it's all women. And I think it's fascinating when men do this. I think it's a way for them to say that they don't know how to do the work to look at what has gone wrong in those relationships. Do I know male narcissists? Do I male, know males who have been in a relationship with a narcissistic female who has completely destroyed them? Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. There are female yes. narcissists. We're not recognizing them fast enough, nor doing enough content to help men around that issue. I mm -hmm. think that's a big spot of, of lack of, lack of awareness, lack of education, a lack of content. But I also think the men who are saying this often are toxic people who are having mm -hmm. lots of destroyed relationships and maybe even picking people in the beginning who aren't the safest and not mm -hmm. taking a look at maybe they're like they, they say, oh, women are looking for bad boys. Well, there are men who are looking for bad girls, too. So to kind of wrap up on demonizing narcissists, I'd love to know kind of what your final thought on it is. And I'll offer mine. Are we? Should we be? I mean, what do you think? What's your takeaway on this? Uh, point the spotlight at the abusers. You know? Yeah. They yeah. are the bad guys. They are the true bad guys. True, not going to change, 
utterly bad guys. And I think we need to see it that way. They're not going to change. They're awful. They suck. <laughs> so they're the rubber band we, that's going to. So yeah. demonizing kind of implies that we're kind of giving them qualities that they don't have. Mm. They, though, these, we are just being realistic. <laughs> we're just sharing the truth about yeah. narcissists. We're yeah. not giving You'll them never, any qualities. You and I, you and I will have. never say they all cheat. No, they don't. Right. I, I try not to never. And I also don't believe it's just men. I, I think it's both men and no. women. I think that no. you and I are trying to be very careful about gender. And, uh, but I, I do think that if the shoe fits, you need to wear it. Yes. So a common problem, Tara, that I hear often is people get into these toxic relationships and then by the end, they no longer can tell who was the toxic person who actually started the chaos and drama. And then it's really common for victims to ask themselves, are they the narcissist? So I have a little simple exercise that I think can help give clarity. If this is something that our listeners are struggling with, I think if they stopped and gave, asked themselves to take a really good history of their personal background, that they can kind of clear up the confusion. So the things that I'd love to have you ask yourself is to go back and identify key friendships in your life, key relationships, key family relationships, not just romantic relationships, but look at these different people who've served an important role to you throughout your life. And then also list your work histories. What was your first job? What did you do for your second job? What are you doing now? And then rate them how healthy those relationships or those work experiences have been. Is there a lot of chaos and drama in those situations? Did it crash and burn? Uh, are you? Are, did you have like a, a blow up where there's now no contact? Did you have to like suddenly walk away from a job and did you get fired for unknown reasons that no one wants to talk about? I often think that if you look at this, you're going to end up finding a clear history of, yes, there's a lot of chaos around you, a lot of disturbances and and trouble, or you're going to find that for the most part, you've had a pretty calm, quiet history until you met this person or met people like this person. Because I do know sometimes victims get into subsequent abusive relationships without really realizing why. So it's not fair to say just because you had a couple, you know, traumatic or chaotic relationships, that means suddenly you're the problem. But if you look at the whole picture, you'll be able to get a clearer picture of it. And here's the other big takeaway. Abusive people, narcissistic or entitled people don't often see themselves as the culprit. They tend to blame everybody else. So usually people just asking me the question is a really good sign this person's got some self-reflection and some empathy. But but I have met narcissists who are becoming self-aware. So I do know there is that group who sincerely wants to know and probably is the problem. But I know that most often those who ask this question, they're not the problem. They usually have gotten caught into a a very difficult relationship that has made them feel like they're the problem. Yeah, I love that. I think just a couple other questions to add was, what are the patterns you're seeing and what may have been your part? Because I know for myself, I I had a a lot of relationships that blew up or ended and seemed awful. You know, but really when I evaluated my part, I'm like, oh, I had tried to set a boundary. Yep. And they had a huge reaction or I had tried to take care of myself or whatever, like being able to really evaluate it from that perspective. And you made another really good comment before we came on air. And that was sometimes we get we think we're the problem because they set us up for reactive abuse. Hmm. You know, so sometimes we need to differentiate that. Like, no, I was provoked. This it was self-defense. That's not my normal reaction. I felt like I was cornered or I had no out or I lost my voice. That's very different than trying to control someone or just to intimidate somebody. Thank you for joining us today. Have a question or comment? Email us at hello at breakingfreewithcarrieandtara.com. If this episode has been helpful, consider becoming a supporter. And if you haven't yet, make sure to follow us at Breaking Free from Narc Abuse on Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook. We'll see you back here next time. 